simply continuing to perform adequately, then you're just trying to not lose. Well, if you continue to perform with an excellence, then you are now in it to win, performing with an excellence. Avoid playing the trying not to lose energy or the trying not to lose game. Always opt for the I'm playing to win this game instead. Fear of failure. Fear of, fear of failure stops many people from even going after what they want. Some people tend to dwell of what happens if they fail. They focus on thoughts that will happen if nothing goes right. When you do that, you picture all sorts of negative hypothetical situations and eventually talk themselves out of doing something that could have been done wonderfully. When people venture outside of their comfort zones and need to focus on their potential benefits and remembering it's important to go after them, after all, there's no such thing as failure. There's only results. You'll never fail again. You'll never fail again at anything again for the rest of your life. There's only results. And if you get results that you don't like, you'll naturally adjust your behavior based on the results to persist until you achieve your outcome. If you get results you don't like, you'll naturally adjust your behavior based on the results to persist until you achieve your outcome. To get past the fear of failure, answer the following question. To get past the fear of failure, getting past the fear of failure, answer the following questions. If you knew you could not fail at something, what would you do? What would you achieve? How would your life be different than it is now if you knew you could not fail? First, you must conceive it. Then you must believe it. And then finally, you will achieve it. Your initial answers to these questions are outcomes that you should pursue. Go for it. Make them a reality. Remember the mistakes are great ways to learn. Mistakes are just a great way to learn. We all make mistakes sometimes. And the more we make them, the more better off we are. And since this means we're all learning faster than we better off we are. Since that means we'll be learning faster than if we weren't making any mistakes at all, as long as you avoid making catastrophic mistakes, the little ones make can make you can be your best teachers of how to do something the right way. Even if you did not, even if you did nothing and tried your hardest not to make a mistake, mistakes could be impossible to avoid. Since doing nothing in or in itself would be a mistake, you are bound to making a mistake once in a while. So let's just make the most of them. The secret, start making the most mistakes as you can. One motto is to go by is this. Fail forward fast. Fail forward fast. Keep on making the mistakes and learn from them. Adjust and move on. Then repeat the cycle without making any mistakes. There's no personal growth. Without personal growth, there is stagnation. Be confident about mistakes. Be confident about mistakes. They're simply ways in which we learn. There's a success and a confident secret of go-getters all around the world. And after each success and they experience, they integrate that success into their identity as further evidence that they are unstoppable. And after each mistake, they start thinking simply as a byproduct of their behavior and learning opportunity. The mistake doesn't cast any doubt on who they are as people. Many people have their strategies flip-flopped. Instead of integrating the success as a part of who they are, they dismiss them, and that's all wrong. Dismiss the mistake as flukes, but not the successes. People downplay their successes with each phrase as, oh, I just got lucky, or oh, it's bound to happen sometime. Those phrases absolve the person from any responsibility for taking action and generating the success. Knowing these phrases popping up and out of other people's language and yours too, then avoid using them even ever again. It wasn't luck. It was you. It wasn't luck. It was you. To get the victories to occur more often, just as soon as you have a major success, visualize yourself having the same results again in many different contexts. When you got the winning feeling, it's such easier to imagine it yourself having the same feeling over and over again in the future. Visualizing the victories is different contexts and it will help you create a belief that the success is part of who you are, not just an isolated incident that occurs from time to time. Here's how to be successful, and here's how successful people view their mistakes. Well, the mistake is simply a function of what I did not a part of who I am or who you are. A mistake is something to learn from. A mistake, a mistake lets you know that you should adjust your behavior. Here's how successful people view their successes. Success is part of who, I, who you are. It happens because you are a successful person. Success is something to congratulate yourself on and celebrate. Success can be built on to reach even greater heights in the future. The confidence you are rapidly developing can take to a form of a snowball. At first you pack the smallest bit of snow in your hands and make it as dense as possible so that it sticks together and then you place a small snowball on the top of the great big hill and as you roll the snowball down the hill the snowball gathers more and more snow and it gains momentum. Pretty soon the snowball is unstoppable and it keeps getting bigger acquiring more snow and faster. That's how your confidence is going to be growing now. 
You're packing the small snowball for the t snowball for the techniques in this book, pushing the snowball down the hill. With the snowball racing down the hill, you are stepping further and further outside of your original little comfort zone. You'll be amazed how surprised and delighted you'll find of how much you'll enjoy this wonderful personal growth. Once you adopt this belief that mistakes... Once you adopt the belief that mistakes are your gateway to learning and natural parts of the process, your confidence will immediately begin snowballing faster. What makes the difference between successful, confident people and those who are tentatively tentative and do not pursue their dreams is the way that they actually view their mistakes. If you want to do something well, it's worth doing poorly at first. But that is why taking action is almost always better than taking no action at all. In taking action, you will either get your outcome or you at least get something so that you can do something even better the next time. If you fail, take action out of the fear. If you fail, take action out of fear. You will never learn nothing and stay stuck in the same place as you were. The confident man and the confident mindset allows you to make as many mistakes as you need to as fast as you possibly can. The key here is to correct what you're doing based on the feedback that you get regarding the mistake. Be constantly correcting. Eventually, you will get your desired outcome. And after you succeeded, you will learn to integrate the success into your identity as well as, the person, as, as, well as being a person of unstoppable confidence. The tentative mind sets and holds the mistakes that are, they tend to think that they're bad and they should be avoided. But as you become more confident in yourself, you'll naturally find how effective the tentative mind set is in terms of going after your dreams, how ineffective the tentative mind is. Mistakes are really only a measure of one specific instance of your behavior. They are not personal evaluations, and a mistake is just a moment that you had a mistake as far as a tentative or a temporary behavior. They are not a personal evaluation of your worth or your as you as an individual. Avoid taking mistakes personally. Don't take mistakes personally. Instead, learn from them and move on. Failure from an unstoppable confident perspective. Failure from an unstoppably confident perspective. Confident people are confident because they know that they can achieve anything they want. How do they do this? Because they have a history of persisting until they succeed, until they win, until they get what they want. They may experience temporary setbacks from time to time, but they always learn something from these and do something different. And eventually, until they finally achieve their goals. So, how do you do this? Well, I'm reminding you of a story that you may have already heard. A group of frogs on a farm came across a bucket of milk. And the farmer had accidentally left behind. And they dared each other to jump over the bucket and... They did, and over and over until the frog kept misjudging his jump and fell into the milk. He tried to scramble out of the bucket, when the sides were too slick and he fell back in. He could hear the other frogs laughing at him outside. Not only was he in danger of drowning, but the other frogs that but the, the other frogs that he thought were his friends were laughing about it. He was determined to get out, so he swarmed and jumped and flailed about. And the more he tried, the more they laughed at him. So he kept it up, and as he kept it up, all of his motions ended up churning the milk until it became butter. And when the butter was thick enough, the frog had enough leverage to jump up and out and escape. And what does this teach us? If you want something badly enough, you will achieve it, no matter how it happens, and no matter what happens, no matter what anyone says, even if those whom you thought were your friends tell you otherwise, always know that you can. Refrain from asking yourself a question like, Is it possible? Or can I do this? You already know that you can do it. Presuppose it is as a given. Presuppose it as given you can accomplish whatever you set your mind to accomplish with the inevitability of achieving your goal already firmly established ask yourself what is it going to take to accomplish my goal what is it going to take to accomplish my goal this question assumes that the possibility of success is already a definite in your mind and now the only thing is to determine is how specifically will you get there chapter 9 act as if Act as if quality persons create a quality life. Successful people ask better questions, and as a result, they get better answers. Anthony Robbins. So now you may be wondering how to get unstoppable confidence. We've talked about confidence. We've talked about what it is, what it isn't, as well as about aspects of your language and body systems and how they need changing. But how exactly do you get there? Parts 3 and 4 give you techniques and exercises to help you change your language and change yourself. To get started, here's the first step to set you on your journey to unstoppable confidence. Acting as if. Acting as if is an NLP essential. 
If you act as if something is real for long enough, you will eventually forget that you are only pretending, and however you are acting will become your habit, and this is one of the keys to neuro-linguistic programming. People who used to be shy have used this as-if frame of mind to develop their confidence. The difference between people who are confident and those who are shy are their habits. Habits can either be good or bad. The secret is to have a wealth of good habits. The more empowering habits you have, the better life will be. Developing these habits of behaving confidently can be enjoyable too. It's exciting to witness your personal transformation as you gain more confidence in yourself. The pretend it, have it technique. The pretend it, have it technique. The mind and body are part of a cybernetic system. This means that the body influences the mind and the mind influences the body. You can pretend to have a confidence, reliving confident experiences in your mind, which will get your body to adopt confident physiology. Or, if you choose to adopt confident physiology, your mind will adjust from what you are seeing, hearing, and feeling internally to experience confidence. You can use this to our advantage, and we should use this to our advantage. Getting confident is no different from pretending to have confidence. Keep doing it for long enough, and pretty soon you'll forget that you're pretending. And by the time you've done that, the confidence will become a habit. Following that, your confidence gets integrated into your personality, and it becomes a part of your identity. Remember, times as a child when you played make-believe. Children have excellent imaginations. They're very good at playing and consequently learning. People make play make-believe now and pretend that you have the confidence before you really do have it. Here's some questions about confidence. Questions about confidence. Imagine what it would be like to be ten times more confident than you are now and answer the following questions. How would it be? How would you be moving differently? How would your body posture be different? How would your inner voice be different? How would you be speaking to others? What is going through your mind? How does your body feel? Where is your body? Where in your body do you feel the confidence first? How could you intensify that confident feeling in your body? By answering the questions, you can do what they invite you to do. You will see your unstoppable confidence soar. You will see your unstoppable confidence soar. When your confidence soars, forget that you are pretending and take action to do whatever you need to do to get done. When I was learning how to walk up to strangers and begin talking, I would ask myself these questions one by one. With each question I answered, I adjusted my behavior and pretended as if I already had the confidence that I was seeking. And after answering all the questions, I could actually feel unstoppable confidence within me. This propelled me to introduce myself to strangers and begin talking to them. The reverse of this technique is also true, so be forced warned about that. If you think about shyness and adopt your body language, your mind and body will make you feel shy. But if you catch yourself doing this, acknowledge it, and then begin asking yourself the confidence questions, which are designed to get you into a super confident state, into a super confident state. Now work on your way through the techniques and strategize in parts three and four. Before long, you won't be acting unstoppably confident. You'll be unstoppably confident. Again, the questions about confidence are, how would you be moving differently? How would your body posture be different? How would your inner voice be different? How would you be when speaking to others? What's going through your mind? How does your body feel? Where does your body feel the confidence first? And how could you intensify this confident feeling in your body? Chapter 10, Mastering Your Internal Voice. Make a game of finding something positive in every situation. 95% of your emotions are determined by how you interpret events to yourself. Brian Tracy. Imagine a private radio station in your mind that broadcasts just for you. If the DJ put on a record that played a whining, droning voice constantly cataloging your failures and griping of how hard life is, you'd feel pretty bad, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want to turn it down or fire the DJ? Conversely, what if you could listen to rich, warm voice reminding you of all the great accomplishments of your life, the things that make you happy and thankful, the goals and your dreams that you have? Wouldn't that feel just great? Wouldn't you want to listen to that a lot? With the volume high enough for you to feel it vibrating throughout your body? Well, that's exactly what we are going to do in this chapter. By mastering some basic NLP techniques, neuro-linguistic programming, or self-talk, you are going to learn to be useful with your internal voice to positively change your state of mind and direct your thoughts in resourceful ways. No matter how you have been using your voice your whole life, using your voice ever, in the past, you will master your internal voice so that your state of mind becomes and stays absolutely fabulous. Squashing negative internal dialogue. 
Many people have a negative internal voice that is constantly eating away at them. This negative internal dialogue often dwells on bad things in life and is quick to put down in some other nasty comment. Consequence, consequently, it's difficult for people who moved ahead if they don't first conquer their negative internal voice. This kind of internal monologue can use and cause a negative self-fulfilling prophecy. If you let it rule your mind, you will also, it will also rule your world. What occurs far too frequently is that negative internal dialogue discourages someone from doing something bold and constructive. Then this person attempts to take the initiative and fails and internal voice rubs it in. This further drive homes in the false belief that a person cannot do whatever he or she, she has set up to do. This negative internal voice that becomes more powerful because it was right before and it incapacitates, incapacitates the person again next time he or she dares to try to step outside the comfort zone. This cycle must be stopped. Considering all of this, how would you like to silence this negative internal voice once and for all? First, first identify the qualities of your negative internal monologue by answering the questions listed here. When you're aware of the specific qualities of your negative internal voice, you can more easily silence it. Whose voice do you hear? Where does the voice seem to come from? At what level is the volume of that voice? Does the voice speak rapidly or slowly? Now, now that you are more consciously aware of the voice than ever before, you can squash it. To do this, you must actively choose to change the qualities of the internal voice. You can do this by imagining the same voice with no vocal properties altered. Sometimes the negative internal voice is that one of the both of your parents. Sometimes the negative internal voice is your own. What would happen if you took your voice and made it sound like, say, Mickey Mouse's voice? It would be hard to take that highly pitched voice seriously, right? Well, what would happen if you had made another favorite childhood cartoon character's voice for the other voices? Or perhaps a clown's voice? Don't take my words for it. Do it yourself and find out. The next time you recognize a negative internal voice, mentally repeat just what I said and make it the voice of Bozo the Clown. You might be surprised to discover how quickly an internal voice that used to keep you stuck becomes meaningless when it sounds like this. What happens if you put your negative internal voice? What happens if you change where your negative internal voice comes from? Put the voice in different locations and farther away to lessen the impact. Picture a voice coming out of your kneecap, softly taunting you about your shortcomings. Notice how this changes things. What happens when you speed that voice up so very fast that it is almost incomprehensible? like a record turned up to 180 RPMs. What happens when you slow that voice down so much that it's a deep and distorted that you can adjust your internal voice and though in the same volume dial? Turning the volume up or down in a suite of a situation, in the suit of a situation, most likely the quieter the voice, the less influential influence, influence it will have. Find that that works best for you. Find out what does and use it to thwart the impact of that pesky negative internal voice. The underlying foundation of this technique is the idea that you can consciously direct your mind instead of just allowing it to function on impulse. You can consciously direct your mind. With the techniques I've outlined, you will be consciously directing how you hear your internal voice. I bet you're feeling better about having more control over the negative internal voice and that voice is having less and less of an impact on you. Amplifying Positive Internal Dialogue And inhibiting as a negative internal voice is, a positive internal voice can be twice as effective in leading you to greatness. Everything that you have did, everything that we did in this last section to de-emphasize the negative internal monologue, you, well, now you'll learn to do this in reverse, to amplify the positive internal monologue. When you hear positive encouraging words inside of your mind, take a moment and silently thank yourself. If you hear something positive or something upbeat in your mind, anything, take a quick second and thank yourself. Eventually, you won't feel the need to do so, but when you feel the confidence of your positive interior voice, congratulations are in order. As your internal voice bursts forth with positive words, reinforce them with the appropriate behaviors. The more you reward yourself in acting this way, the more in the way that you want, the more you will find yourself automatically acting in this way that you want. You won't even have to make it a point to do so. It'll simply become a reflex. Your ideal internal dialogue should be your own voice. The reason for it is, is that you and you alone run your life and make the decisions. If the internal dialogue is a voice of anyone other than you, you are effectively relinquishing your personal power to that person. Since you are the one running your mind and your life, reclaim both by making an internal dialogue yours alone, forever.
Simply re replace the current voice of authority in your life with your own voice. Let me own positive voice resonate within. Let your own positive voice resonate within and allow it to spread throughout your whole body. Wherever you're hearing, wherever you hear that glowing, positive internal voice, let it bloom from within like it's coming from the largest speakers that you ever heard with the loudest volume imaginable. The louder the volume, the more vividly you feel and it will course throughout your entire being. So when you want to really feel it, crank up the volume. While your positive internal voice shows up more and more often, sometimes it'll give you a positive statement disguised in a question form. As an example is, you can do it. The tone may be questioning, but in a deep voice sentence or a statement, ratchet up the power of internal voice by turning the sentence into a statement. You can do it. You can do it. Repeat in, in your mind a few times if you need to, and next make an internal voice even stronger by converting it to the statement into the exclamation. Like, instead of saying, you can do it, now you say, you can do it. Shout this instead inside of your mind so that there can be absolutely no doubt. Find your passions. Find your passion. Your confidence will grow with each and every technique that you add to your repertoire. The more your confidence grows, the more you will discover how much you want to reconnect with your passions and go after them. In doing this, ask yourself, if money were no object to you and you knew you could not fail, what would you do in your life? The immediate answer is the question in your passions. What should you do with your life? Using the technique you're learning in this book, stamp out the negative internal voice that might try to vein or crop up. Find your passion. Find your passion. Set your goals. And then take immediate, repeated, massive action that will virtually guarantee your success. Commit to yourself that you will never quit. Remind yourself that you have quit quitting. You have officially quit quitting and more and, the, and move ahead into the life that you want to deserve and you should have now. Chapter 11. Speaking the languages of competence. Dedicate yourself to the good you deserve and desire for yourself. Give yourself peace of mind. You deserve to be happy. You deserve delight. Mark Victor Hansen now that you've mastered our internal voices, it's time to turn our attention to our externals, how we project our internal dialogues to the outside world, the vocabulary of confidence. If you listen to other people talking, you will notice that those are confident use of certain vocabulary, and those lacking in confidence seems to draw their words and phrases from an entirely different dictionary. Most people don't give a lot of thought to the language that they use, as such people's habitual language patterns reflect back of their thinking, being confident thinking, or lack thereof. Not only does language reflect a person's thinking, but it also reinforces a person's thinking. The key to use is the following information of transforming your everyday vocabulary. When this occurs, you will not only change your thinking, you'll change your life. So, what are these changes? I have assembled two sets of words that you must take into account when speaking. Two sets of words you must take into account when speaking. First, there's a set of words that you are absolutely need to eliminate from your vocabulary. And then there's a set of words that you need to memorize and integrate into your speech in order to project the maximum confidence. It is hard to overstate the importance of sending the right signals with your language, but it is easier learning to do so than you may think. Let's get down to it. The confidence killers. First, we'll tackle the set of words that need to be eliminated completely from your vocabulary. And if you catch yourself using this word, say, hey, wait a minute. I'm no longer shy. There's a better word for that. Don't beat yourself up when you hear yourself using one of these words. Just acknowledge that you've used the word in the past and increase your efforts to eliminate it from your vocabulary in the future. Try. The first word is try. Have you ever heard someone say, try to do it something? There's a difference between trying to do something and actually doing something. Quite simply, trying is lying. In Star Wars, Yoda said, there is no try, only do. Yoda was right on the money. There is no try. If you ask someone to do you a favor, the person can't say, well, I'll try. No, you can count on him or her for not doing the favor for you if they say, I'll try. Otherwise, the person would say, I'll do it. The word try communicates a maybe attitude in the world that craves certainty. Instead, use the word do. Say, I will do it. Eliminate the word try. Try is gone. Never say try again. Never say try again. Don't try to eliminate the word try. Just do it. The shy sentence. I try to do the laundry. I'll try to do the laundry tomorrow. The confident sentence. I will do the laundry tomorrow. Try becomes do. Try becomes do. Try is gone. No more try. It's do. Hope. 
Hope is another word that is not for confident people is hope. Now, hope is a nice and pleasant word. However, it announces a lack of action. For example, I hope things will get better or I hope my situation resolves itself. Contrast with I'm going to make it better and I'm going to make my situation better. Hoping that something is to happen is being reactive, whereas taking action and expecting success is proactive. The shy sentence, I hope I can take a trip to Hawaii someday. The confident sentence, I'm making plans to take a trip to Hawaii next year. But, but negates every word that precedes in its sentence. But negates every word that precedes it in a sentence. As an example, I want to go to the movie, but I have a lot to do. In this example, it sounds as if the person will not be going to the movie. When someone hears the word but, he or she immediately knows that what was just about said should be just disregarded. If you want to communicate the same thing without using the word but, dis substitute the phrase with and yet, and yet. The shy sentence, I want to go, but I have something else going on. The confident sentence is, I want to go, and yet I have something else going on. The three ouds, the three ouds, would, could, and should, the ouds, well, here's the ouds, would, could, and should. As Dr. Seuss might have said, it was concerned with confidence. Here of the three ouds, there are no good. As we, as we go through each ood, we'll discover how its usage is in some places decreases confidence. The ouds are no good. We'll learn how to replace these words with that will propel you with furtherness into your success. Propel you even further into your success. Would. What is a conditional word? It's not confident. It's not absolute. But when I was discussing this notion writing a book, some people said, yeah, I would write a book too if... And then they give some reason why they supposedly precluded them from writing a book. Well, would, well, would is conditional and presupposes there's something standing in the way of success. It's pointless to use the word would because nothing can stop a confident person from achieving success. Eliminate the word from your vocabulary. The shy sentence is, I would talk to strangers now if only. The confident sentence is, I will talk to that stranger now. Could. If someone says, I could go meet that person, then my question is, well, what's stopping you? Using the conditional word could implies that there's an ex certain ex certainty attached to your action. For example, I could go meet that person or I could go to the mark. I could go market my business to 10 new people and expand it. Just as we've seen with the word would, could also suggest that there's something preventing you from achieving your goal. Could implies that there's a chance by the message it sends to don't count on it. Eliminate it from your vocabulary. It's much better to use more definite phrase such as I can or I can't. I can or I can't. Could is, it's, it's letting there's a chance that it won't be done. It's either I can or I can't. The shy sentence is, I could try to make a speech in front of my peers. I could try making a speech. Confident person says, I can make a speech in front of my peers. Should. Should is the worst of all the oods. Should implies expectations and limited options. Think of the sentence, I should be doing this right now. Well, you should be doing this according to whom? Ask yourself that. Whose expectations? It's all with your own, within your own expectations. At least it's all about your own. Your own internal frame of reference. After all, you're running the show. You're leading your own life. You're a unique individual in charge of what you're doing. Saying should is like keeping yourself hostage by limiting your choices. Should... If you have preconceived notions that you should always do certain things in a given circumstance, then you're not going to investigate other options because you're not going to do what you should. And that's a limiting perspective because whenever you have fewer choices, you have less control over your life. Confident people don't have that problem, regardless of whether or not the situation dictates they should. The shy sentence, it's late and I should get home now. The confident sentence, well, it's late and I choose to go home now. Confidence builders. The confidence builders. Now that we've talked about the words that uh, we're going to be eliminating from our vocabulary, let's discuss the words that will skyrocket your confidence when you integrate them into your daily thoughts and speech. The underlying principle and definition of purpose. Words that show confidence and let people know what you want. Words that show confidence and let other people know what you want. Here are the words and phrases to add to your vocabulary for enhanced confidence. 
absolutely, definitely, positively, assuredly, without a doubt, of course, certainly, undoubtedly, obviously, guaranteed, naturally, sure. What do all these words do? They communicate a message that there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that this is the way it is. Now, as you begin to use these words, notice how people respond to you because they will respond differently. If someone asks, what do you want to do? There's a number of responses. Here are two examples. The undecided sentence. Well, we should do something fun, I hope. The confident sentence. Well, I absolutely want to see a movie tonight. You will notice the difference between someone who is confident and someone who wants to do something and someone who may want to do something, yet is too shy to say what that might be. The language of motivation. Now let's talk about how to use language to motivate yourself to do what you want. You could take a task of action and that you don't particularly care about and crank up your motivation so that you just have to just do it. Model operators. This goes back to our use of language and how it shapes our model of the world. With this technique, you will focus an aspect of language called model operators. When you listen to someone's language, and especially his or her model operators, you will hear so much about that person moves through the world and how the source of his or her's motivation. So what are model operators? They are words like must, have to, need to, will, can, should, would, and so on. For our purpose, they fit into three categories, necessity, possibility, and impossibility. Model operators of necessity. As model operators, necessity indicates that something is necessary and that something needs to be done, but they are words such as have to, need to, must, mandatory, and required. As such, using them in the right places in our language to excellence for motivation, I have to take a break. You need to go do some training. We must work on this project now. It's mandatory that you do your confidence exercises regularly. Model operators are possibilities. Model operators of possibilities are words such as can, could, might, possibly, maybe. These words are possible possibilities to us. When we use them correctly in our language, a model operators, not only one is the dreaded uds, they imply choice. We have no, we have so many options we can pursue. I have, I could make it at 9.30 p.m. sharp, easy. I could make it 9.30 p.m. sharp, easy. Perhaps we might consider the new developments. Model operators of impossibility. When you have a model operators of impossibility, these words are to imply that we simply cannot do something. Cannot is just one of those words. Cannot, will not, must not. Notice most model operators of impossibility close off options that may have been available to us. I'll never go back to the old way of being. You must not neglect the following these instructions carefully. I can't go a day without doing my unstoppable confidence exercises. How to easily motivate yourself. So how do we use this knowledge of the model operators to crank up our motivation? How do we simply start chaining them together? I want you to follow along in this example. We will begin by saying a set of phrases. Each of them will differ in just a few subtle but powerful ways. Now, the purpose of this exercise is for you to fully experience the impact of this technique. I want you to say each of these phrases out loud, confidently, powerfully, and take on the confident physiology and sit up straight and say these phrases with an authoritative tone of voice. We will begin by thinking of a moment that's taking tomorrow off from work. Or, if it's a weekend as you read this, taking off an upcoming Monday. Notice that it's like motivation. Your beliefs from whether or not you can do this will be influenced by how you say the words and the exercise to yourself. I want you to say to yourself, I can't take tomorrow off. And notice how you feel about taking the day off tomorrow. Can't is a model operator of impossibility in the present tense. Now say, I couldn't take tomorrow off. Notice how using model operator of impossibility closes off that option. Then say the following sentence, I can't take tomorrow off. As if you fully assume the confident physiology, say aloud, I couldn't take tomorrow off. While you do this, notice how it feels to you internally each time we exchange one of these model operators for the other. Feeling, the feeling will change. Next, say aloud, 
I could take tomorrow off. Using the could will alter the experience as if you find a saying it produces a different feeling. It might be compared to a contrast of the difference be feeling between all the sentences that you think about. How one word can so drastically alter the meaning and feeling of the sentence. Could shifts your thinking from that the impossibility into thinking that something is possible, albeit with conditions attached. Well, to paraphrase the sentence, you could take tomorrow off and some condition were met. The conditional aspect is implied through the usage of the word could, as I explained earlier. Now, say the same sentence replacing could with can, and I can take tomorrow off. Your thinking has become shifted from possibility of taking tomorrow off if some condition were met to a very real possibility in your mind that you in fact can take tomorrow off if you choose to amplify this possibility next replace the model operator in the sentence with may say to yourself out loud I may take tomorrow off may preproposes that you may or may not take tomorrow off and implies that not only the fact that you can do something but it suggests that you are considering whether or not to do it where we've gone now to absolute impossibilities to serious consideration regarding taking the day off. Now use your next model operator. I should take the day off to tomorrow. Next say to yourself out loud, I shall take the day off tomorrow. This exercise has taken you from a conditional probability to almost certain. You're, full, you're finally making a commitment to yourself to take the day off tomorrow because you deserve it. After all, don't you? Next, tell yourself, I have to take the day off tomorrow, really says, like in your sanity depends on it, then notice how much more powerful the expression becomes, that I have to take tomorrow off. When you say, I have to take the day off tomorrow, you can feel it course through every part of your body. Next, say, I need to take the day off tomorrow. You need to. Taking the day off tomorrow has gone from a requirement to a necessity, a fundamental need. Notice how these differences increase your motivation that, that much more. Finally, use the model operator that you've seen here and you've been waiting for. I will take the day off till tomorrow. I will take the day off tomorrow. That says it authoritatively. That I will, I will, I will. Authoritatively and powerfully. Notice how committed you are in taking the day off to tomorrow. Look at how much your motivation has changed. You Just because you've changed the word on each continuum of motivation, you become from a place of... It was absolutely impossible to take the day off to tomorrow to becoming committed to taking off the day off tomorrow. This example demonstrates the power of these words and how people are using words to either limit themselves or model operators of impossibility to motivate themselves, the model operators of necessity, or to empower themselves with the more options of the model operators of possibility. Chapter 12, The Body Language of Confidence. If we are to have magical bodies, we must have magical minds. Dr. Wayne Dyer Body language is just as important as verbal language. Your internal messages, images, sounds, emotions affect your physiology and vice versa. Confident body language versus shy body language. Quick lesson. Confidence and shy body language differ greatly and are rarely mistaken for each other. By realizing the difference, you can be assured to maintain confident body language as you build unstoppable confidence. Here's some examples of a shy body language. Hanging your head as if you're ashamed of yourself, slumping your shoulders forward, drooping your spine instead of standing up straight, looking down on the ground. Having a confident body language is just as easy to spot. It sends a much better message. Here's some examples of confident body language. Keeping your head held high, having your shoulders thrust back, keeping your abdominal muscles tucked in, standing up tall and proud. And if you don't feel confident in given, any given moment, you can project confidence through your words, gestures, and body language. Avoid wimping gestures. Some people resort to blaming, pla implicating in stressful situations rather than communicating their willingness to find a way out of the situation. They become panicked and are concerned with who's at fault. These people clearly lack the confidence. If they were able to alter their behaviors by maintaining a powerful, confident physiology, their internal states would match them on a calm, cool, collected, becoming a calm, cool, collected person. Maintaining composure is much more resourceful and effective for solving a problem than blaming or placating ever could be. Here are some methods for you on how to improve your body, how to move your body to stay confident. Never use placating gestures. Confidence, confident people never make placating gestures. These gestures convey that you are inferior, submitting to others, person. A classic placating gesture is when someone shrugs his shoulders with palms facing upward. 
if, as if you're pleading, I didn't do it, or this conveys a need to absolute oneself a responsibility of the situation. In order to have unstoppable confidence, you must avoid these gestures at all times. Another placating gesture is the shrug, which means someone doesn't really know what's happening, and perhaps even don't care. It does not make any sense to convey that you don't care about any situation ever. So if you don't know about something, simply admit as much as the matter-of-fact way. People lack confidence often to give an exaggerated response, announcing in an annoyed tone that they have no clue. A lot of times you can find an answer to a problem if you just stop for a moment and think about potential situations. Instead of giving up so easily and pleading ignorance, Henry Ford said, Thinking is the hardest activity there is to do. That is why so few many people engage in it. People who are confident may not necessarily have the answers, but... Yet they do know that they have all the resources to find the answer. When I ask someone a question and the immediate response is, is I don't know, it indicates to me that this person is not even willing to make an educated guess to the initiative to finding out an answer. The better response when you genuinely do not know is to say, well, I'm not sure yet. Well, this indicates the truth about your uncertainty and proposes that you will probably be sure to sometime in the future indicate, indicated by that word yet. So never say, I don't know again. Just say, I don't know yet. Never use blaming gestures. The opposite of placating is blaming. Unstoppable confidence people will never do this. Blaming takes place when you're accusing someone else in your stead. This blaming frame of mind is very negative frame and it does not empower you at all. The classic gesture associated with blaming other people is pointing fingers or some other, or for some people to learn when they're young, when your point, finger pointer is aimed at someone else, that there are three other fingers actually pointing right back at you. Too many people blame, and it is not useful. Confident people come from a place of wanting to find solutions. They come from an options and how to solve problems and create solutions. They move through the world calm, cool, unperturbed by outside events. They manage their emotions rather than letting their emotions manage them. You manage your emotions. Avoiding both blaming and placating gestures will help you and who you are, an unstoppably confident person who solves problems and gets the, jobs, the job at hand done efficiently. Who and what caused the situation is irrelevant. The main idea is to solve it. You don't care who or what caused the situation. Your main idea is just to solve it and prevent it from occurring again in the future. Practice unstoppable body language. And if you want to feel like the most charismatic person around, project good thoughts outward, they will manifest themselves in your body language as well. Walk confidently. Confident people have a certain walk. When they enter a room, it seems as though they belong there, even as if they own the place. As you practice walking in confidently, remember that the situation is whatever you make it. Keep your head held high, your shoulders back, your tummy tucked in, and make a move and move through the world in deliberate steps. Feel free to walk at your own pace instead of adopting the speed everyone else is using. Avoid shuffling your feet, looking down at the ground. You'll notice a difference as you practice your confident body language and pay attention to the way you walk. Steeple your hands for confidence. Steepling is a gesture that conveys confidence by pressing your fingertips together while keeping your palms separate, touching each, each of the fingertips to the opposite hand. Many unstoppable, confident people steeple their hands to exude confidence. In fact, so many confident people do this gesture that's no, it's now associated with confidence. Get in the habit of steepling your hands when you want to convey confidence to others. The modern, the wonder of smiling. The wonder of smiling. If you want to have more confidence, all you have to do is smile. Practice smiling with anyone you see. Anywhere you go, do it when you're at work, home, or in the store. No matter where you are, give someone the gift of a smile. As you make it a habit, smile. Practicing making a smile with small talk. You'll soon discover that your conversations will be flowing with greater ease than ever before. Ask how, ask how they are doing. Ask about their weekends. Find out how they, what they want in life. People love to talk about themselves and it feels good to really listen attentively to someone else. Even for me in the depths of my shyness, smiling was a very effective technique. Bringing a natural happy guy smiled often just because he was in a mood and the mood struck me. But when I discovered, what I discovered is, is that when I smiled at people, they would naturally smile back. And in fact, I'd make a game out of it. How many people could I get to smile sometimes when I... Sometimes when someone didn't respond to my smile, I approached, I kept broadening my smile until the person finally broke out of his or her stonic facial expression and smiled back. Smiling is disarming. It puts other people at ease. Since giving a smile is absolutely free and it always feels good to either give or receive, you should smile as often as possible. The Sound of Confidence Another key to confident communication is an excellent vocal tonality. 
Vocal tonality is the pitch from which you speak. And if your voice is nasal, for example, you'll be irritating and irritating other people. Certainly it's not a good thing if your goal if is to project a confident image while communicating with them. You want a tonality that resonates within other people and causes them to feel good. Most people aren't even aware of it. But your vocal tonality has an effect on people in the unconscious level. Speaking with bad tonality, well, it's like running fingernails down a chalkboard. Personally, I'd rather listen to a dental drill than listen to someone drone on with nasal tonality. Tonality exercises. The good news is, is that people can improve their tonality through repeated practice. To exercise, you will need to place your hands on a certain body part and place your in attention while there while speaking. As a result, you will notice a shift in tonality. And by the end of the exercise, you'll have a deep, resonant tonality. Place your hands on your nose and say, this is my nose. The tonality should be nasal now and probably very irritating. Move your hands down to the mouth and now say, this is my mouth. And as you do this, listen for the difference in your tonality already. Next, place your hands on your throat and say, this is my throat. And you're changing the tonality yet. Place your hands in your upper chest and declare, this is my chest, and notice the tonality becoming more resonant. Finally, place your hands on your abdomen and say, this is my abdomen, and when I, and when I talk like this, I get a deep, rich tonality that people enjoy. When your attention goes and the energy flows, this is the reason why your tonality gets better when you concentrate on your abdominal area. If you want to listen and model the tonality after someone, turn on the radio and really concentrate on how the disc jockeys use their voices. You'll never find a disc jockey with a nasal voice for reasons mentioned before. The look of confidence. Confident people are always able to look at others straight in the eye and tell it like it is. By looking someone in the eye, you will perceive as being more sincere, genuine, and honest. More sincere, genuine, and honest. No matter what you are saying, if you just look them in the eye, then if you are shifty-eyed or avoiding eye contact, people who lack confidence tend not to look others directly in the eyes. This elicits suspicion from the person from whom your non-confident person is interacting. Because most people, when they are telling the truth, look others directly in the eye. If you're not, if you have nothing to hide, focus your attention on looking people in the eye. You can even practice feeling good while doing it. Now, if you have a tendency right now to avoid eye contact, that's just fine. Call it a starting point. But after you do the following exercise, you'll discover how easily and naturally you could do it. And by the end of the exercise, you'll have informed the beginning of the habits. The difference between confident people and shy people, in summary, is that confident people have the habits that cause them to behave confidently. Conversely, shy people have the habits that cause them to act shy. Eye contact exercise. This exercise is designed to give you the ability to be present with someone and look that person straight in the eye, giving you more confidence. You'll be a You'll need a partner for this exercise. A great partner would be a supportive friend, spouse, or relative. Read through all the directions first and then begin. Read through all these directions first and then begin. By doing this exercise, you'll naturally find yourself breaking through the limits of your confidence and it'll rise in an unprecedented level. Set an outcome for what you want to get out of this exercise. One good outcome is to be able to look people in the eye anytime. Tell them any time that you choose and feel at ease while you're doing it. Get a timer that will let you know when five minutes is up. What you were going to do is sit across from your partner in a complete silence and be present with him or her. All you have to do is be silent. Look the person straight in the eye and beware. This is harder than it sounds. But as you do this exercise, you may have certain urges to laugh or look away. That only means that you now have an opportunity to break through the previous held limits. Stay with the exercise and continue looking your partner in the eye. Meanwhile, your partner will be doing the same with you. And if you do laugh or glance away, your partner should gently say, Stop. Be present. Start again. Similarly, if a partner laughs and glances away, give him or, him or her the same instruction. Continue on doing this for the entire five minutes. Having this skill means that you can confront any person to be there for him or her as a good listener. Your direct eye contact with another person means that you're neither superior nor inferior. But you are merely two equals, communicating on a level ground. Do this exercise with your partner as many times as you can, and you'll need it in order to be able to look someone in the eye. And pretty soon, you'll discover that it is really, really easy to do so, with no longer to being intimidated to direct eye contact. The real world is a true test of gauge. Now, how you've come from, of how far you've come. After doing the exercise, practice in the real world and notice how easy it is that you do it. How surprised will you be when you find others doing it automatically? Others will react positively to your new confidence, and this eye contact that you've learned is not designed to intimidate, but foster better communication through honesty and openness. It will also let other people know that you have the look of confidence.
Part 4. Becoming Unstoppable. Chapter 13. 21 Explosive Techniques to Supercharge Your Confidence. First comes thought, then organization of the thought into ideas and plans, then is transformation of those plans into reality. The beginning, as you will observe, is in your imagination. Napoleon Hill. The techniques, exercises, and strategies in this chapter will speed you on your way to unstoppable confidence. Practice them regularly and watch your confidence soar. Technique 1. The Instant Shift. One of the major steps in gaining more confidence is being aware when you're lacking confidence. The reason for this is that you have to be aware of something before you can change it. When you're aware that you're not being as confident, you can change it. It will no longer be a given that you're shy or tentative or whatever they label you previously used to describe yourself. As you become consciously of what your mental process is with respect to confidence, pay particularly attention to your internal voice. If you have a limiting negative voice nagging at you, I'm sure you naturally realize that you can stop your stop you dead in your tracks when you really want to go for it. Well, while you're paying attention to your internal voice, notice the sorts of images that are inside of your mind. When you hear and see internal impacts on how you feel, and the way you feel either frees you to take actions or hold you back. Now, when I was locked into my dungeon of shyness, any time I wanted to go out and meet a woman, I would project a big picture of a woman rejecting me and laughing at me before I even said hello. With these images in my head, I was completely paralyzed with the fear and took no action. Instead, I watched an opportunity pass me by, and I regretted it every time. If you want excellent feelings, you have to see and hear excellent things, which is easy because you're in control of your own mental processes. Whenever you're acting shy, you must simply stop and realize that this is a process and that you can change it. And if you find yourself acting in a tentative way or shy way, here are some NLP techniques that you could try. Interrupt the process. Imagine a police officer springing up inside of your mind, holding a red stop sign. Imagine that he shouts out with an authoritative tone and loud as loud as he can and says, Stop! When you hold these images in your mind, you'll find yourself immediately stopping the processes of feeling that lack of confidence. Shift your state, and once you stop the process, you can change your directions and go in any direction you want. For purposes that you should immediately shift your physical state to one that exudes confidence. Employ excellent physiology and posture. Head up, shoulder back, stomach tucked in. Put your smile on your face. Feel good just like that. And if your body is in this state of confidence, it's easy for your mentality and for you to mentally follow suit. The instant shift. Number one, recognize your shy or unconfident action. And number two, interrupt the process. Number three, shift your physical state to a confident posture. And then four, let your mind follow suit. Technique two, rehearse confidence. Once you interrupt a negative mental process, you could then consciously choose your emotional state you want to experience. You won't be merely acting out the habit. You'll be acting out a conscious choice that is very powerful. And with this technique, you can program yourself to have unstoppable confidence whenever you need it. The key is that when you rehearse what you get, you the key is that what you rehearse is, is what you get. A friend of mine who was into martial arts always reminded me that train the way you fight because you will fight the way you train. This holds true for being confident as well, and by rehearsing confidence in your mind, you will have it when you need it. For you to have unstoppable confidence, you need to mentally rehearse it in your presence. This means that you're going to have to visualize what you desire. Confidence. We will watch ourselves walking, talking, moving confidently. We will see ourselves doing things that never before have been done, not even and realize that were possible. If it's difficult to do this at first, don't worry. Visualizing is a skill like any other, and you will need to get better at it with practice. If you think that you have difficulty visualizing, pretend that it's easy for you. You have a way of dealing with anything. One way to dealing with anything to fake it until you make it. Pretend that you can visualize as you do that. You will develop such, such a skill in, visualize, in visualizing that pretty soon you'll forget that you were just pretending and you'll soon be a great visualizer. Now, now that you're visualizing, focus on the image of yourself behaving confidently as projected on your mental movie screen. Notice how you exude confidence in every fiber of your being. Now others can sense it coming from you. As you can see yourself behaving confidently, listen to what you hear as you fulfill your experience, that ultimate state of confidence within. To amplify your confidence state, make the picture bigger, brighter, closer. Crank that sound way up in your state of mind so that you could feel that confidence coursing through your entire being. Let the past resonate all throughout your body. Let the bass resonate. When you make these adjustments to your experience, notice how much powerful and confident you become. Do this exercise as many as you 
times as it takes to thoroughly feel the confidence inside of you. How will you know when you've done it right? The answer is that by looking at the mental images of your confident self, you'll automatically feel the confidence. This is how you know that you're successfully completing this exercise. Your unconscious mind does not understand the difference between a scenario that is genuinely real and a scenario that is vividly imagined. For that reason, vividly imagining confidence is your future means that you are literally programming yourself to have the confidence when you need it. Set a trigger for confidence that you've rehearsed. Here's how to set yourself up for confidence anytime. Number one, close your eyes. Number two, watch yourself on a mental movie big screen as confident. Number three, enhance your visual and sound qualities of the movie. Number four, jump into your own on-screen body and let's see through your own eyes and hear what you hear and feel total confidence. Number five, hold your thumb and your first finger together as you experience confidence. The more you feel confident, the harder you press your thumb and first finger together. After five seconds, separate your thumb and first finger and open your eyes. Repeat the first step. Re repeat the first seven steps, but watch a different confidence scenario. By doing this, you'll have programmed your mind to respond to a feeling of your thumb and forefinger pressed together as a confidence trigger. Confidence trigger. Now that you've rehearsed it, whether you need confidence or not, you could just close your eyes and press your thumb and forefinger together as long enough to let you have starting a feeling that you've triggered and it starts flooding through you. Rehearsing confidence. Focus on an image of acting confident as on a movie screen. Listen to yourself speaking confidently. View the picture in a close up, turning up the volume. Feel the confidence as you project it on screen. Technique three, program confidence. You and I have all the resources that we'll ever need to become total, successful, unstoppably confident. Many people discount how resourceful they could potentially be to have unstoppable confidence in the future. The key is to be able to summon your own confidence resources that will get you the results that you want. You did it successfully in the past, which means you can do it successfully anytime. It's only a matter of practice before you have the confidence whether you choose to switch it on. Remember the time that you were unstoppably confident in the past. Become aware of what specifically you did see, hear, feel inside as you re-experience what it's like to complete completely be confident. There's a structure to your confidence experience in the same way that there's a structure to your building. There's certain qualities that you see, hear, feel, and building this specific to that building. Similarly, this is a certain thing that you see, hear, and feel only when you are in a confident state. While you relieve a past, while you relive a past time when you were confident, ask yourself the following questions. To become aware of the visual qualities of confidence, what size is what you see? What size is what you see? Do you see a picture or a movie? Is it three-dimensional? How clear or fuzzy is it? How bright is it? How close is it? Is it in color or is it in black and white? As you ask yourself the following questions to become aware of the auditory qualities of confidence that confidence has for you, ask yourself, what do you hear? How loud is it? What's the tempo? What's the pitch? What direction does the sound come from? And ask yourself the following questions to become aware of the sensory qualities of confidence. Where does the feeling begin in my body? How intense is the feeling? What direction does the feeling come from? And how long does this feeling last? By altering the visual, auditory, and sensory qualities of confidence, you can actually amplify your confidence state. Practice playing around in all of these different qualities. See the appendix for more qualities. And notice the results and the effects of your confidence state. This means that you can build even more confidence state once you find the qualities that work best for you. As you relive your past confidence and relive your past confidence experiences, become aware of the visual, auditory, sensory qualities associated with the experience. Realize that you can use these same qualities to program yourself in an unlimited limited confidence in your future. The way you do this is by imagining situations in the future where you will need unstoppable confidence and imagining your future confident self adjusting from what you see, hear, feel to match your past experiences of confidence. You are literally programming your mind to have unstoppable confidence in the future. When the moment arrives, you will mind, your mind will act as if you already experienced it before and give you the unlimited confidence. Any subject or event coming in your future, start thinking completely confident about it, and when the event comes, you'll already be confident about it. As I've said, the mind does not make distinction between what is real and what is vividly imagined. Real time scans the brain to reveal whether you take a physical action or simply vividly imagine doing it. The same areas of your brain are activated. You can take advantage of this by programming your mind in advance. Program confidence. Number one, relive the past experience in which you felt confident and noticed all visual, audio, 
auditory and sensory qualities associated with that experience. Now imagine a situation in the future where you'll need that type of confidence and imagine yourself adjusting to what you see, hear, and feel to match the past experience of confidence. Technique four, anchoring. Many who have studied psychology will be aware of the groundbreaking experiments conducted by the animal behaviorist Ivan Pavlov that determine the power of stimulus response conditioning. After noticing that a dog salivates when they eat, he propelled a unique stimulus, the shining of a light, with the presentation of the dog's meal. Pavlov would turn on the light immediately before giving the dog food. After several rounds of this, the dog would salivate even when the light was just turned on, but no food was present. Prior to this pairing, shining the light had no effect on the dog's salivation, salivation. But after the stimulus, the light had been paired with the response, salivation, the dog would reliably salivate when the light was shone. The phenomenon of stimulus response conditioning has come to be known as many circles as anchoring. An anchor is a stimulus that triggers a mental state. An anchoring is an anchor is a stimulus that triggers a mental state. It has been applied to a phobia treatment, motivation, and other areas of personal development. The beauty of anchoring is that it can be very easy to do for yourself. Properties of good anchors are that they elicit a strong emotional state, they must be unique, and they must be repeatable. Now, if it's all very well to work for yourself into an unstoppably confident state manually when you have the time, but what about when you'd like to get into that state instantly? Well, this is anchoring and where anchoring comes from. When you want to get yourself into a state of being confident, motivated, and strong, you can easily pair the state of stimulus of your own. Many people like to use music. If you want to do this, pick a piece of music that matches and maybe even evokes the state that you want to anchor, such as the Eye of the Tiger or the Chariots of the Fire theme. Pick one of your favorite confidence techniques and do it along with the music. Do this over and over again and you'll find that listening to the music immediately plunges you into that state. You can even anchor states with internal stimuli. Any imagine, any image that automatically puts you into a certain state already in, already in an anchor. For some people, just thinking about the smiling face of their spouse puts them in a romantic state. Just thinking about a happy baby is enough to make many people melt with a tenderness. All of these mental techniques is designed for tapping into a natural power to activate an emotional circuitry of your brain and body to produce a confident state. Once you have that state, you can pair it with an outside stimuli like music or pictures, or you can associate it with internal stimuli like remembering images, sounds, or feelings. The following is a great internal anchor of mine and I want to pass it on. After you imagine a few times, you'll naturally associate what you see and hear inside of your mind with a powerfully confident state. Picture a jet black puma at the top of a glorious canyon spans miles across. Puma radiates intensity with its black is arched and its poised pounce and its unsuspectedly prey below. The prey does not even realize what will transpire as the puma knowingly licks up its sharp teeth. But as you watch the scene, if you will, step into the puma's body and become the puma. See with the puma's eyes. Hear what the puma hears. Feel the unstoppable confidence state that the puma has as you become completely aware of just how easily you are going to devour your prey, accomplish your goal, or devour your prey, or accomplish your goal. To even more fully experience this confidence state, let loose with a growl that will rival any puma, puma, puma alive. Doing this will help you associate this powerful state with the sound of a growl. After doing this exercise, you'll be able to simply growl internally and immediately go back to this state of unstoppable confidence. All you'll ever need to do to get this, again, is to stop for a moment, 